Hey everyone, it's Ryan Locke. I'm a personal injury and appellate lawyer in Atlanta, Georgia. And I also maintain the website, um, the High Tech Resource Guide, uh, the guide to getting medical records for cheap for lawyers and uh, patients who have to um, use medical records because they've been in a car wreck or um, they've injured themselves on someone else's property or they've been the victim of negligence in some other way. And I'm here to talk to you about the um, Judge Mehta's order in Siox versus Alex Azar. Um, this order is from the, the District Court for the District of Columbia and it was issued on the 27th and um, I'm here to answer this, this question that everyone is probably asking themselves. Um, is it time to panic and freak out? And the answer is no, but maybe a little, but probably not. So here's what's happened. Um, before the 27th, you could make a request for your medical records and ask them to be sent to you in an electronic format and ask that they be sent to someone else. So I could say, I'm Ryan Locke, doctor, I want my medical records on a CD and please send them to my lawyer. And I would get charged what's called the patient rate, which is the fee limitation that's contained in the High Tech Act. What has changed is as of now, I can no longer ask that my medical records be sent to a third party and receive the patient rate. What I still can do is request my own records, have them be sent to me, and pay the patient rate. Let's step back and talk for a minute about the um, the history of the patient rate and what this lawsuit was about and what the order actually did. And then we can talk about some um, strategies for continuing to protect our clients' money when we're using their medical records in litigation cases. So first, so HIPAA was passed by Congress in 1996. And in 2000, the Department of Health and Human Services, which is the federal agency that administers this law, made uh, the privacy rule that created the patient rate. And the patient rate is the charge that a medical provider will charge you for your own records. This is separate from what a provider will charge another medical provider if the other medical provider asks for those records. If you know, my primary care physician asks my surgeon for records about my surgery so they can um, continue, you know, have a continuity of care. And it's also separate from when people like me request the records, when law firms, um, life insurance companies, other businesses who request the records for commercial purposes. So in 2009, Congress passed the High Tech Act which amended HIPAA. And for our concerns, the High Tech Act did um, two important things. One is that it said a patient has the right to request their medical records in an electronic format and pay a, um, a fee that is capped for those medical records, not a per page fee, but a fee that is capped. The other thing the High Tech Act did is that um, it said that patients can send the, their private health information in the electronic health record, or EHR, to a third party. Those are the two things it did. In, um, in 2013, HHS passed um, what the court calls an omnibus rule. And it said that one, the fee cap applies when, the, um, when the, the patient requests records either in paper or electronic. So even if you request your records in paper, 
the, the fee cap that's in high tech still applies when the patient requests them. Um, that, that implementation is now gone, and we'll talk about that in a second. Now, three years later in 2016, HHS passed another rule, and this is called the Privacy Rule Guidance. And what HHS um, said there is what, what we've relied on um, for the past four years, which is the fee limitations in the patient rate. So the fee limitations that were a part of high tech apply when the patient wants those records to be sent to a third party. Here's the problem, and this is what this lawsuit was about. What Psyox argued was that um, it, it was a lawsuit brought under the Administrative Procedures Act, um, and if you, if you took admin law in law school, buckle up, and if you didn't, fast forward for 45 seconds because you, you, saved, yourself, you saved yourself some effort and time. So the um, Psyox made an, a claim under the Administrative Procedures Act that it was um, that HHS did not follow proper rulemaking procedure in issuing this 2016 privacy rule guidance. And in fact, that they did not use a notice and comment period when they implemented this rule. Now, if you remember back to admin law, sometimes you have to have a notice and comment period and sometimes you don't. And it depends on ex exactly the kind of agents, uh, action that the agency is taking. And HHS said, for this kind of thing, we don't need to have a notice and comment period. Psyox said he did. And the judge agreed with Psyox. So the major holding out of this order is that the fee limitation on the third party directive must go through a notice and comment period with HHS bef before anyone can challenge it for other reasons. So the court has declared this provision unlawful because, not because of anything inherent in the fee limitation, but only because the procedure by which HHS promulgated this rule was wrong. And hopefully, HHS will you know, go through a, a notice and comment period and then promulgate this rule again, and um, everything will be back to the way it was. The, the other thing that the order did, um, the other major holding in the order, is that only electronic health records are subject to the patient rate. Now, to me, this is not a big deal because um, I, I don't really want paper medical records anyway. I want electronic health records because they're just so much easier to use um, and they're just so much easier to obtain. I'd rather that Psyox mail me a CD than 1,600 pages of documents. So I am, um, I am not to, and quite frankly, in practice, now it seems very rare that I get any paper medical records at all. So I'm, I'm not too upset by that other holding. Obviously, I'm disappointed with the, um, with the third party patient rate limitation now being gone. Um, is there anything good in this order? Yes. On page 54, um, Judge Mehta um, determined that the labor cost involved in preparing the electronic information for copying cannot be included in the labor rate. So the, the High Tech Act, if you remember, it controls the cost of, of what a provider can charge you for your own medical records to the labor cost in producing them, the cost of postage, and the cost of the media that they put it on to send it to you, like a, a CD or a DVD, um, I, I guess theoretically like a thumb drive, but no providers are doing that. So um, for the labor cost, providers can either charge you the actual labor cost when there's something that's unique about your request. So, um, or they can charge you an average labor cost. Let's say that they produce, um, they have very unique records and it takes more time than any other medical provider. Um, I could see maybe like radiographic films or something. 
And so if there's a, an above average cost for every request, then they could charge that. Or they can charge just a flat rate of 650. And most providers seem to be charging 650. Some providers um, seem to be fooling around with what the actual labor cost was and quoting some real exorbitant labor cost, um, which doesn't really make sense unless your request is um, somewhat complicated. Like, I don't know, I guess, imagine that I went to um, the same, I don't know, primary care provider for all my life and so I have 20,000 pages of records and I only want the pages that deal with my, um, you know, with, um, you know, my asthma, let's say, which has existed since childhood. And so um, that, that might be a, a more expensive labor cost because they have to go and segregate out these records. Um, obviously, there's not really an increased labor cost if I say, look, just send me the 20,000 pages. Um, so now, the change in calculating the labor cost is medical providers are not allowed to charge you the cost in preparing the records for transmission, F finding the records, sorting them, putting them in the right format. You can't charge for that anymore. The only thing that you can charge is the actual time spent in copying the records, which should be minimal because you're burning them onto a CD and then popping the CD in the mail or you're uploading them to the portal and then the, the, the patient is downloading them. And so that should not be a significant amount of time. The, and, and obviously the, um, the, the other you know, good thing remaining in the order is that the fee limitation continues to apply when a patient is requesting their own records um, from a medical provider. So uh, as lawyers who request medical records every day for our clients, what do we do? One, I think in, in, in my experience over the past you know, year and a half or two years, and in talking with a lot of lawyers about this stuff because of my high-tech webpage, it seems like most records are being produced in an electronic format and people are being charged under $30 for them, whether they're following the high-tech rate or not. And so I think for most of my requests, um, things will not change. It, it may change slightly. Instead of paying you know, $6.50 or $8 for records, maybe now I'll have to pay $25 or $30, um, which is a significant difference in that cost. But in the, in the you know, a uh, grand scheme of the case, um, you know, I, I don't think that it really moves the needle if n my clients have to bear an extra hundred dollars of costs in the case. Um, what will move the needle is if they have to bear thousands of extra dollars for, you know, medical records from a hospital or um, somewhere where they were ad admitted for some period of time or that the page limitation, uh, or, or the, the, just the, the size of the medical record is voluminous. Um, and so here's, here's what I think we should do. One is for medical records where we think that they're going to cost a lot, hospital records where they've been admitted, um, if they've had really extended treatment at a certain provider, um, and you know the, the records are, are 10 or 15,000 pages long or something like that, the patient can still request them directly and be charged the 650. And that's a conversation I think we should have with our clients where we say, hey, look, you, you just spent um, you know, a, a month in this hospital and you had five surgeries there, and I know that the records are going to be large um, and they're going to cost a lot. And so to save you money, I want you to request the um, records yourself. Here's a letter that we can send. They're going to send you the invoice. And then once you get it, send it to me. And then either you pay it or, or, or we pay it. I think it remains to be seen exactly how they're going to administer um, controlling who pays for what. I also think that a patient, under the law, I think it's proper that a patient can request their own records and a third party can pay for them. 
um, the I think the records then will be sent to the the patient slash client, and then we just have to get the records from our client or patient. So that's a pain, and maybe it's not worth the um, the additional time and hassle for you know the difference between paying a provider ten dollars and twenty five dollars. But it certainly is for paying a provider ten dollars versus nine hundred dollars for these records, um, or it, I think it would probably be for most clients. I mean, we can ask them what they want us to do. Um, other strategies that I, I think will remain to be seen if they work. Um, one could be the having the patient request the records and the patient uses a a PO box that you both have access to. And so um, the patient is requesting them for themselves and asking them to be sent to themselves, but you also have access to where they're being sent. Um, I, I think using your law firm address for this is probably too much on the nose. Um, I think a, a shared PO box um, that, that everyone has access to, I think, is, um, is, is within the ruling where the patient is requesting that they come, that the records come to them and the records are for their use. And then obviously the patient can give the records to whoever he or she wants, their lawyer. The, the next thing, so, so you know, one is using true patient requests and with, with the records being sent to the patient's home for, um, invoices that we know are going to be large to control those costs. The second can be using a shared mailbox that the I think it's important for the client has equal access to it because the client is requesting the records being sent to him or herself, but is allowing the lawyer access to come and get the records. Um, I think a, a third strategy is to keep sending the high-tech requests. So you can still send a, it's still in the law, that a, a patient can send a high-tech request asking for electronic medical records to be sent to a third party. So we're not going back to you know, HIPAA releases, um, the, those med records releases. We're staying with high-tech requests. The only difference is that now for these third-party requests, um, the providers are not limited to the patient rate, right? They can charge um, whatever other rate they want, usually a, a per page rate that's limited by state law. So we can keep sending those third-party directive high-tech requests, and I think there, there's going to be some lag in providers recognizing that they can no longer charge you the high-tech rate. And if I think if they charge you the high-tech rate, pay it, and great, you got a deal. I also think that it's, it's I think, become a bit onerous. I mean, it just doesn't make common sense to be charging a per page rate for electronic records, particularly when they're so easy to transmit. And so I think for, for providers who deal with attorneys a lot, I think we can make it as easy as possible for them to get us the records. We can also educate them that HIPAA permits them to email us the records directly or upload them to our, our cloud servers, to a Dropbox or a Google Drive, especially with the patient's express permission. And so we should think about, for, for providers who are dealing with a lot, thinking about educating them on how easy it is to move this data around, especially when the patient consents, and how that, that continues to protect the patient's privacy rights under HIPAA. And so they're not doing anything wrong. They're doing exactly what their patient wants, which is getting these records to the people who need them. Um, and then I think the final point is lobby HHS and lobby Congress. I mean, HHS can promulgate this rule again, go through a notice and comment period, and then issue it as a final rule. And if they do that, then we're back to uh, the status quo before this week, which is the fee limitation applies to third-party directives. Um, that could also be written into high tech, right? Congress could amend HIPAA again to 
um, ensure that to, to make clear that this fee this fee limitation um, applies to third party directives under high tech. Um, either one of those works does what we need it to, and so I, I think that a focus on um, lobbying HHS, lobbying Congress, and letting them know why this is important. You know, ultimately, someone comes to us, us injury lawyers, because they're the victim of someone else's negligence. And in order to prosecute their claim, in order to be made whole, they need the records of their injuries, of what treatment they had, how they were injured, and what it took to get better. They've already paid for these services to the medical providers. And in my mind, it's unfair and unjust to pay thousands of dollars to receive medical treatment and then have to pay thousands of dollars again to get copies of those records when the only reason they had to go through this is because they're a victim of negligence. And finally, because they're the ones who are paying for these records. You know, we, we as injury lawyers may pay for the medical records up front, but when we settle the case or when we get a jury verdict, those expenses are coming out of the client's share. So ultimately, all this energy around applying the fee limitation to third-party requests is really protecting the client's money. You know, I, we all care about our clients, and we're also fiduciaries to our clients. And if we can save our clients hundreds or thousands of dollars, then we should, especially since they're the ones who need them because need that money because they've been injured and they need to get back to where they were. They need to be made whole. I think we should impress um, this reality on HHS. We should uh, make sure that our representatives in Congress understand this. Um, and hopefully the we can get the, the fee limitation back on third party requests. Um, if you have questions, like always, uh, shoot me an email. It's ryan at thelockfirm.com. Um, I also, um, I'll link my high tech webpage and that has more information about this stuff. Um, I'm gonna make some um, new forms um, that we can use, uh, that we can give to clients um, so to protect the patient rate for them. Um, let me know what's going on, um, how providers in your area are dealing with this, um, and, and I can post those observations to the website, and, and then we can all kind of make do with what we have. Um, I appreciate you watching the video. Um, Good luck and thanks.